Trayvon Martin was only 17 years old when he was shot and killed by George Zimmerman. His death and the subsequent acquittal of Zimmerman sparked nationwide protests and the birth of a movement we know today as Black Lives Matter. It's been 10 years since the Black Lives Matter movement was created by organizers Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi. But since then, the list of Black and Brown Americans who have been killed at the hands of police has only grown. Ahmaud Arbery, Alton Sterling, Breonna Taylor, Elijah McClain, Eric Garner, Freddie Gray, George Floyd. I'm Cheyenne Daniels, race and politics reporter at The Hill, and on this episode of The Switch Up, we're going to reflect on the last 10 years of work to spread the message that Black lives matter. What's been done so far, and where do we have left to go? Within the last decade, organizers and advocates have turned out to protest the deaths of Black Americans at the hands of law enforcement. Today, 10 years after its first use, more than 44 million tweets with the hashtag Black Lives Matter exist on Twitter, according to the Pew Research Center. Black social media users are more likely to post or share their support for the Black Lives Matter movement, with 43% saying social media is an extremely or very effective way of bringing attention to the issue of police brutality. But when the first hashtag Black Lives Matter was used after Trayvon Martin was killed in 2012, the outrage wasn't just about injustice. It was also about the larger implications of what happens if a Black person is seen in an area where they supposedly don't belong. Across the nation, Black leaders began highlighting that Trayvon could have been their own child, or even them. You know, when uh, Trayvon Martin was first shot, uh, I said that this could have been my son. Uh, Another way of saying that is uh, Trayvon Martin could have been me 35 years ago. That was former President Barack Obama. He and many others were hoping to call attention to the racial disparities in police brutality. Though more white people have been killed by police, black people are disproportionately impacted. Data from the NAACP finds that while white people make up a little over 60% of the population, they make up about 41% of fatal police shootings. But Black people make up only about 13.5% of the population and 22% of fatal police shootings. That means Black people are about twice as likely as white people to be shot and killed by police officers. In 2022, At least 1,192 people were killed by police, the highest number ever recorded, according to the Mapping Police Violence Database. 100 of those people were unarmed. Black people were three times more likely than white people to be killed, and they were also more likely to be unarmed. Dijane Parker, board member of the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, remembered learning about racial disparities in law enforcement encounters after the Black Lives Matter project was founded in 2013. I don't know about you, but I remember where I was and how I felt when I saw that. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's totally right. Like our lives do matter. And we cannot allow this to happen again, um, not knowing that it was the catalyst to many deaths coming after Trayvon Martin's death. And obviously there was um, deaths before Oscar Grant, but that didn't get so much national attention um, as Trayvon Martin's death did, or even more so the trial of George Zimmerman. And they realized through the viral hashtag that they wanted it to be more than just a moment and create a movement out of it. And so fast forward to 2020 and the murder of George Floyd, that movement was realized globally. And um, as a foundation, we have the duty to carry on this movement. And our mission will always be rooted in dismantling white supremacy and systems of oppression. And that's why Black Lives Matter is so important, because we are still living in a in this country and in a, a world that is highly rooted in white supremacy and systems of oppression. And we know that Black people fall in those margins um, the, at the highest rate. And so really trying to dismantle that system. That system isn't only perpetuated by white police officers, though. Early this year, 
The nation was shaken by the brutal death of Tyree Nichols, a 29-year-old black man living in Memphis, Tennessee, who died after being brutally beaten by police officers during a traffic stop. What was particularly hard for many to grasp was that Nichols's death came after he was beaten by five black police officers. Many, like Reverend Al Sharpton, felt this showed how pervasive police brutality is and that it's ingrained in the system rather than confined to only certain demographics of police officers. And the reason why Mr. and Mrs. Wells, what happened to Tyree is so personal to me, is that five black men that wouldn't have had a job in the police department would not ever be thought of to be in an elite squad. In the city that Dr. King lost his life, not far away from that balcony, you beat a brother to death. There's nothing more insulting and offensive to those of us that fight to open doors, that you walk through those doors and act like the folks we had to fight for to get you through them doors. It was only moments later that Sharpton issued a call to action for federal police reform. Alicia Garza, principal of the Black to the Futures Action Fund, spoke to The Hill about what's driving this call for reform. Black communities want to see police officers being held accountable when they commit crimes in our communities, like we saw in the case of Tyree Nichols in Memphis, Tennessee, and also like we saw in the case of uh, Keenan Anderson in Los Angeles, California, and so many others. You know, it's important that we understand that for so many Black communities, uh, crime and violence is an economic issue. Uh, policing is an economic issue. And the way that we advance public safety is an economic issue. In so many cities across the nation, Cheyenne, a vast majority of funding, uh, general funding for the operation of cities is going towards policing strategies that are not working. Policing addresses crimes that have already happened, uh, but it is not intended, uh, nor is it successful in being preventative at crimes. When Alicia began organizing, she wanted to help carry and build upon a legacy of Black political power. Like many before her, Alicia's goal is to help create a better, more equitable society for everyone. You know, Cheyenne, I grew up hearing all these stories about social movements that by the time I came into the world were no longer really active. Right. So um, I came up learning about the last period of civil rights and the sit ins and the freedom rides. Um, but the freedom rides weren't happening when I was a kid. Um, I grew up listening to stories about the Black Panther Party. But by the time I came of age, the Black Panther Party had been jailed and attacked by the government and, you know, really had been decimated in all these deep ways. I had an elder who told me once that. Um, Everybody goes through a period of time where you think that revolution is right around the corner. You think change is like right there. And for them, the people who came up before me, um, when everything started to be rolled back, they just kept thinking like, will anybody ever know that we existed? Right. Our job right now in a, a period of intense attack is just to like leave breadcrumbs in the forest and hope that people can find us. And I really am driven by that. Right. I really feel like it's important for people to know that there are change makers in every single neighborhood, in every place across the country, and to be inspired by the idea of all of us coming together to achieve the changes that we deserve in our lives. So that's what drives me. Alicia says that in order for change to happen, Black voices need to be front and center in the discussion. President Joe Biden tried to explain why this is important when he spoke at the State of the Union in February this year. Join us tonight are the parents of Tyree Nichols. Welcome. <laughs> we had to bury Tyree last week. As many of you personally know, 
There's no words to describe the heartache or grief of losing a child. But imagine, imagine if you lost that child at the hands of the law. Imagine having to worry whether your son or daughter came home from walking down the street, or playing in the park, or just driving a car. Most of us in here have never had to have the talk, the talk that brown and black parents have had to have with their children. Bo, Hunter, Ashley, my children, I never had to have the talk with them. I never had to tell them if a police officer pulls you over, turn your interior lights on right away. Don't reach for your license. Keep your hands on the steering wheel. What we saw at the State of the Union address, I thought was actually really important. You know, I've been uh, in this work for a very long time. Uh, I attended the State of the Union address, uh, President Obama's final State of the Union address, uh, when I was uh, working closely with the Black Lives Matter Global Network. And, you know, I have to say that it was incredible to hear the President of the United States finally talk about police violence and its impact on our communities, saying things like, every Everybody deserves to go home. That's something that should be counted as a movement victory. And as somebody who's been in this work for a long time, I can tell you, it took us a really long time to get there. But now we have to finish the job, as President Biden said, and we have to make sure that the way that we uh, ensure that public safety is not punitive, uh, is not uh, hyper militarization of our communities uh, or, or wasteful spending right on uh, military grade weapons that turn our communities into war zones, we have to make sure that black communities are at the table. And I don't just mean uh, uh, the voices that you always see at the table. I mean people who are being directly impacted by these issues. But I also mean people who have uh, uh, done the work to be innovative about how it is that we can increase public safety uh, without increasing the level of violence and terror that black communities are experiencing, unfortunately, at the hands of the people who have been tasked to protect and serve. Uh, across the spectrum and across the board from police to communities, I think we agree that we are spending in a way that does not make sense. And so we have an opportunity right here, right now uh, to change the equation. Uh, and it's my hope coming out of the State of the Union address, coming out of this last decade of organizing uh, and the decades before this, right, of organizing to, to change the way we think about public safety, that we actually can claim some more victories along the way. But the movement for Black Lives Matter has faced backlash for the entire decade of its existence. Since the movement began, phrases like all lives matter, blue lives matter, and even white lives matter have been used to combat the original message. Dijanet, board member for the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, says these phrases are rooted in white supremacy. The reason why we say Black Lives Matter is not because we're saying our lives are more valuable than other lives, but we're saying we live we live in a country where in a world where our lives do not matter. And the system continues to show us that every single day by allowing cops to get away with wrongful murders and wrongful deaths and by allowing the, the systems of oppression to continue. And so when people say blue lives matter, all lives matter, they're upholding the system of white supremacy in the, when they're saying that. And I think over the years, the question was like, what do you mean when you say Black Lives Matter? But the institution has been able to really get a hold of tearing people apart from understanding the power of when Black people are free, all people are free. So, you know, Martin Luther King was doing a speech about like the poor man's speech. And it's a system, you know, it's a system that c continues to um, separate us. And so when we realize that if Black lives don't matter, no one's lives matter. And so when we say all lives matter, it's not true because if all lives matter, we wouldn't have these deaths that we do with Black lives. We wouldn't have Black people in so much poverty. And so really trying to um, detangle the nuances there of the system of really America, but all over the globe, you know, this system of white supremacy that was created through enslavement and through the enslavement of our ancestors, uh, which if you look at the foundation, when have when has Black Lives actually mattered in this country? For Shalomia Bowers, board member of Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, the response to Black Lives Matter is built on fear around Black political power, something he calls white lash. White lash is a term that was coined by CNN commentator Van Jones after the 2016 election of Donald Trump. 
This was a white lash. This was a white lash against a changing country. It was a white lash against a black president in part. And that's the part where the pain comes. Essentially, white lash is a combination of the words white and backlash. And it encompasses the idea that racial progress in America will inevitably be followed by white backlash or white lash. When black people have um, tried to you know, express themselves, have made gains in society, um, sort of tried to take a stand, right, in response to movements, you know, there is always um, a reaction. And that reaction is typically with violence. Um, that reaction is typically in the form of policy or trying to discredit uh, Black people, Black organizers, Black work as a way to push back on any gains, you know, that Black people are trying to make in society. So I think a lot of those terms that we saw in response to Black Lives Matter are really part of th this idea of um, of white lash, right? If you, you know, look at uh, where we were uh, with the first Black president, for example, and the response to that was our first white supremacist in chief, right, uh, with Donald Trump. Our response to that was an insurrection on January 6th, um, where we literally saw folks, you know, trying to overtake the, the government, right? All of that is part of the same idea of, uh, well, if you're saying Black Lives Matter, we're going to say All Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter. It's, it's really rooted in, in that same, you know, historical component you know, where, where folks want to push back against any perceived gains of Black Alicia finds that oftentimes people can be scared of Black political power, though that hasn't stopped her from trying to build it up. I do also think that there is a fear of Black power in this country, and um, we've seen it up close, right? When President Obama got elected, Sure, he was very palatable to a lot of um, white liberals, right? He made himself palatable to white moderates, but it didn't matter how much he matrixed to like be something for everybody. Everybody still thought he was Malcolm X and he was not Malcolm X, right? And so there is a fear of what happens when black people get power, but I think that that is a fear that is not only racist, but it hasn't turned out to be true. What's real is that when Black people, by and large, not every Black person, because we do have Clarence Thomas and we do have, you know, we have these outliers. Um, but when Black people get power, we never, ever, ever consolidate power for ourselves. Black people's political participation has always looked like power for Black people and power for everybody else who's getting left out and left behind. That is what it has always looked like. And I dare anyone to give me an example of a time when Black people were in power and only governed for Black people. It hasn't happened. Now, whether or not we want that is like a totally different conversation. But I will say, um, you know, the notion that black power is dangerous to this country is probably actually true. And the reason that it's true is not because black people are going to vote and govern for ourselves. It's because black people deeply understand and experience how inequality in this country is designed to keep us out. And so our full interest in participating, right, is to dismantle all of the ways in which white power has been designed to keep black people without power, right? So there is going to be that consistent struggle. And that's not the fault of black people. That's the fault of how people set this country up, right? So I, I, I think, you know, you have a, an interesting point there. The last thing I'll offer is that I I think there is not just a fear of black power, but I think there is um, certainly a fear of change. And in any moment in the country where you've seen such dramatic uh, demographic changes, you've seen any moment in the country where you've seen an expansion of rights in the ways that you've seen over the last 
two decades, um, you do see this intense backlash. And it doesn't just happen on the right. It also comes from the left. So these are the this is the terrain that black voters are navigating every single election cycle. Building political power is vital to ensuring change, Alicia says, especially around policy like police reform, which has largely been stalled at the federal level. When George Floyd was murdered by a white Minneapolis police officer in 2020, the federal government tried to change things. Most notably, then-Representative Karen Bass introduced the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, a sweeping police reform bill. The legislation would ban chokeholds and no-knock warrants, end qualified immunity, and prohibit racial and religious profiling by law enforcement officers. Though the bill passed the House under Democratic control, Talks for a compromise fell apart in the GOP-led Senate. Two major points of contention surrounding the legislation is ending no-knock warrants and ending qualified immunity. Now, qualified immunity is a doctrine that was passed by the Supreme Court in 1967. It keeps police officers from being put on trial for unlawful conduct, including the use of excessive or deadly force unless the person suing proves both the conduct was unlawful and that the officers knew they were violating clearly established law. This year, Representative Ayanna Presley and Senator Ed Markey reintroduced legislation to end qualified immunity. Well, I mean, I think at its most bare bones essence, um, when it comes to the profiling, the surveillance, the brutalization, the choking, the lynching, the murder, disproportionately of Black people, what it means is zero accountability and is a denial of justice. So, but the history of uh, QI, of qualified immunity, the right to sue state and local to sue uh, local and state officials, including police, is a Reconstruction era law passed to protect Black folks in the South who were experiencing significant backlash. Um, to the rights recently established through the 14th Amendment, okay? The legislation establishing this right, the Civil Rights Act of 1871, was also known as the Ku Klux Klan Act. So these protections were a direct response to rampant white supremacist violence against court people, against black people, simply existing and exercising our rights. The court decisions that establish qualified immunity aim to undermine uh, these laws. So, you know, the, the very roots of QI really, uh, you know, are rooted in white supremacy. In many ways today, in 2023, we see the lower courts all the way up to the Supreme Court uh, being complicit in what I would characterize as policy violence, oppression, marginalization, and the obstruction of justice. And qualified immunity is not dissimilar uh, in any way. So it's very origins, the roots of it. This was something created by the courts under the dark of night, if you will. And it has been uh, strengthened and codified uh, over and over again. So it's, it's really just a, an unjust doctrine. Presley says not everyone knows the history of qualified immunity or why it's so problematic. But, she says... Much of what hers and Senator Ed Markey's resolution is focused on is sending a message that no one is above the law. Ending qualified immunity has been a major point of the police reform movement. For many, including Presley, passing the Ending Qualified Immunity Act is vital to ensuring Americans, and particularly Black Americans, can receive some sense of justice in cases of police brutality. First of all, I believe the people closest to the pain should be the closest to the power, driving and informing the policy making. So bearing that in mind, we have to listen to the families who have been tragically impacted, who have been robbed of their loved ones, disproportionately black folk for walking while black, jogging while black, driving by black, uh, sleeping while black. This is what impacted families who've been robbed of their loved ones uh, at the hands of law enforcement, of police, people who have taken an oath to uh, protect uh, and to serve. Public safety really must mean public safety. 
and uh, certainly we have tragic tragic instances after uh, the other that that has not been true uh, for Black Americans. So the families who have been tragically impacted and robbed of their loved ones want an end to qualified immunity. So we need to center them. We need to listen to them. You know, Black Lives Matter is more than statement T-shirts and hashtags and plazas artfully painted. It's about codifying the value of black lives in our budgets and in our policies. And it's about advancing policies that seek to undo centuries of harm and to chart a different path forward. If there are no consequences, then what is the deterrent? People will continue to operate with callous disregard for black lives, for black bodies, without any consequences. There's no deterrent. So why wouldn't people just continue to operate in that way to brutalize, to choke, to murder? Now, having spent time with a number of these families who have been tragically impacted and robbed of their loved ones, I know there can never really be justice. Justice would mean that their loved ones would still be here, but there must be accountability. Presley says... There is no one piece of legislation that will end police brutality overnight. And as her bill most likely faces opposition in the GOP-controlled House, it's unclear whether it will even make it to the Senate for votes, though Presley says she won't stop trying. But some activists, like Shalomia, point out that they have had some success in changing things at the state level. In terms of where we were then, and, and where we are now, you know, nine, ten years ago, you know, in Ferguson, the demand was for body cameras and safer, more humane jails and prisons. You know, it, we, we were actually entertaining conversations about training for police officers. I will say that I was absolutely part of that crew, unfortunately, and I'm so glad that abolition allows for the evolution of people, right? And and that we love everyone and allow for growth. But the point that I uh, make about nine years ago to now is that for the last three years, people have been demanding to defund the police and invest in our communities, right? Uh, uh, to in, invest in non-carceral approaches to community safety, uh, to invest in uh, approaches that aren't about uh, punishment, right? And that is a huge win to have shifted the center court. Uh, and that came because of brilliant black organizers on the ground that came from brilliant abolitionist communication strategies that came from new progressive waves of politicians, which were, you know, supported by frontline organizers. Um, and it was the result of uh, decades plus work, right? And that work is what we as a foundation will continue to invest in, but to have shifted the center court um, in this time frame, right? 10 years is a massive win. Cicely Gay, another board member for Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, said an important component of keeping the momentum is by continuing to educate as many as possible on the mission of Black Lives Matter. I think what's been injected in the in the lexicon now is that it's a human rights movement and that people understand globally that we are not focusing on um, changing specific laws um, as, as kind of our mission, our only mission, but we're more about fighting for a broader and more fundamental shift in the way that Black people are, are valued and treated, right? A shift in society where we do not have systemic dehumanization. And, and earlier in the conversation, we talked a little bit about how a good way to examine Black progress is to look at white outrage, right? Over, over time and throughout history. Um, and so when we take a look at what folks are angry about right now, I think about CRT and education. We are being met with banning books and objections to um, curricula that gives voice to Black people and others in marginalized communities. And so on the flip side of that, um, we, we must look at the progress in education because there have been many wins there. Though much has changed since Floyd's killing, Startling statistics from the database mapping police violence underscore just how much hasn't changed at the same time. 
police officers have been held accountable in multiple cases since Floyd's murder, and more than 30 states have passed 140 oversight and reform laws on local police since Floyd's killing. But activists say they won't stop calling for change until the federal government steps up too. I'm your host, Cheyenne Daniels, race and politics reporter for The Hill. And from all of us at The Hill, thanks for listening to this episode of The Switch Up. We'll have more episodes delving into the intersection of race and politics soon. So be sure to follow The Hill at T-H-E-H-I-L-L on all social media for future updates, including episode drops and articles. The Switch Up was created and written by me, Cheyenne Daniels. Script editing for this episode was done by Steph Thomas and audio editing and production by Christian Carter.